All right. Well, I will try to speak up for everybody sitting in the back of the room. All right. Well, um, I uh, have a bit of a cold, so please uh, bear with me on that. If I start having a, a coughing fit, I will. I got my water over here, and we'll try to try to make it through. So, what uh, what the plan is here is we are going to uh, start working through Isaiah. Isaiah is sixty six chapters. All right. So, just can you think of? Any book of the Bible uh, that is longer than 66 chapters. Yep, the Psalms, uh, book of Psalms. All right. <clears throat> Can you think of any others? As I reconfigure my, uh, all of this here. Now, if we, uh, if we put some collections together, like uh, Samuel, 1st uh, and 2nd Samuel, which are very likely the same author, 1st and 2nd Kings. <sighs> okay, we're... Yeah, so some of those... Yeah, but not unlikely to be the same author. So, so what the point I'm trying to make here, and I will get this technology figured out eventually. It works very well on Monday nights. Um, the point I'm trying to make with this is that the uh, Isaiah is such a large and significant book, and yet... It's kind of underrated. We uh, don't study it uh, nearly as much as we uh, probably should, um, in part because of the nature of the book being prophecy. It's really kind of hard for us to understand. It's very, I found it very challenging because they, you'll go from the past to the present and then all of a sudden he's talking about the kingdom that, that's coming, the, the uh, uh, Messiah, Messianic kingdom coming. And you just always wonder, well, what is he talking about at that moment? So you always have to kind of do your little research to figure out what he's, is it past, is it present, is it now? And right. Evidently, Isaiah, I don't know that he was a priest, but he had connection in that, in, in with all the four kings, he, he had to, to the, to the, Palace. He had connections in the palace that he, you know, and because uh, we're studying it at, 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 at our Sunday school class, and it's just really interesting how he has, uh, 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 like, for example, a great, great example was after Sennacherib, the Assyrian, they had, uh, God had killed 185,000 Assyrians and they went away, that then other countries that Assyria had beaten down on were sending their envoys trying to figure out how did you do it so here come the babylonians yeah and and, and isaiah goes right to hezekiah who right. are those people what did they want yeah and we'll we'll we'll, we'll yeah. get to that you know you're jump you're jumping the gun on me here I'm but, sorry, but um but yeah you're, you're talking about the the past and the present that with a lot of things in the old testament it feels a lot further away in terms of the gap between our present. Maybe I should specify this. Our present where we are now with where they were then. You know, they were the Jewish people, all right, under the law of Moses before Christ. Uh, we are New Testament people, and the gap seems much shorter, you know, 2,000 years ago versus 2,700 years ago. 
and which makes a lot of plus we have the fact that it's prophecy which uh, as uh, TC was mentioning there uh, gets difficult to understand because sometimes it's a you know prophetic future from Isaiah's point well that was 2700 years ago so is that something that has already happened between now and then is it something that is yet to happen in our future? Plus, uh, there's often uh, poetry involved, a uh, Hebrew style of writing, um, using uh, repetition or uh, very figurative images. It's a, <clears throat> an Eastern worldview versus a, uh, where we are inheritors of the Western Roman uh, worldview. We like things a lot more sequential in order, and we don't always have that with the prophets. So all of this to say is it is it makes it difficult, yet not impossible. Um, now before we, we dive into the notes here, I also want to share this. There are different, when it comes to studying the Bible, there are different levels of study, okay? The, there is the uh, academic level. And you, you pick up a, a commentary at the bookstore or on Amazon, and you know it's really hard to uh, determine, you know, just from the cover, is this an academic level? Is this... Uh, college professors writing for other college professors. Um, now, there's nothing evil or wrong about the academic, just sometimes it seems out of touch with reality. You know, uh, getting into nuances of, of Hebrew language and how... Uh, and how the Hebrew language, and when they translate it into Greek with the, the Greek translation, and, you know, and, and just stuff that the average Christian, uh, or in this in the case of Isaiah, the average Christian or the average Jew, it's just Jewish person is not um, relevant. You know, it, it seems so... Uh, uh, detailed to the point of trivia. Now there's another level that you could call it pastoral. This is uh, the level of Sunday school teachers, preachers, uh, where we kind of go a little bit deeper. And that's kind of where this class is aimed. Uh, we're going to try to uh, teach you some things that are not may not be um, readily apparent just because you don't have the same tools that I do uh, in my library to, to pull out some things. But then there's another level. This is the devotional level where this is about listening to God for our daily lives. Now, ideally, the pastoral serves the devotional all right sometimes the pastoral you know we're teaching a, a bible a bible sunday school or preaching a sermon sometimes we veer more towards the academic but let's be honest you don't want john or i preaching about nuances of hebrew verb tenses <laughs> however I'm, I'm increasingly convinced that in the church we do people a disservice by making people think that if they're not doing the same level as the pastoral, then, then they're not doing Bible study. Okay, you don't need to do what I do. Now, there's things that can help you but sometimes people think it's like, okay, go out, lead a small group, get some people together and do a Bible study or do a, uh, or disciple them. 
And I think some people think, well, I, I got I to gotta be able to do what Sam does. But you don't have time to do what I do. I, I get paid to do this. <laughs> you know, when you're working another job and you got family, you got commitments, and you got your volunteer stuff. You know, I say all this because I want people to know that the devotional level is a valid level of understanding scripture. That if you if you just and, and we could do that in this class, just okay, let's just read Isaiah one and then what are you hearing from God? Okay. Um and that is absolutely valid. In fact, there are disciple making movements around the world where uh you know people who like people in India who do not have the ability to uh, go to seminary, uh, you know, get a bachelor's and then go on for a master's and go on for a doctorate and then go into a preaching career. There's, I'm not sure the exact number, two, three billion, you know, or you take Asia as a whole, there, there's not time for that. The, the urgency there, uh, I was at this uh, conference, they were talking about, you know, how long would it take to uh, evangelize the entire continent of India uh, with the normal methods, you know, like, okay, focus on a preacher, uh, <clears throat> a church plant being, we get a building, and then we... You know, maybe we have 10 or, or 20 baptisms a year. When you're trying to reach over a billion people, you know, it's going to take, uh, and one guy, he, he did the math, uh, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but something like 1,300 years. But that, but that would just be to reach the current population. But the current population is not going to be there in 1,300 years, are they? So the uh, urgency, there's what's happening in parts of the world is called disciple-making movements, where uh, one person will like go to a village and they'll gather, you know, a group of people, and they'll do uh, some very simple devotional level Bible studies like we talked about. And then after a year, year and a half, they all get sent out and go to the next village and gather a group of people and do this. So there's the understanding that every person is a disciple maker. Every person is a pastor. Every person is called by God to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, again, you, you're, you're not going to do that if, if we rely on this idea that, oh, I, I, I've got to, I got to do the study to get to, to this level of Bible study. No, you, you get them started at the devotional level where you teach them how to hear, to read scripture, to pray, to apply, and to share, <clears throat> and then you release them out. And then they don't stop. You know, if, if that's all you do and that's where they stop, well, no. You know, there's still more to learn. The Bible is both simple enough that children can understand it yet deep enough that you can spend a lifetime digging and learning more. Okay? So don't ever think, I can't do this because I haven't mastered it. Because if, if we think that, oh, I, I can't do this until I master it, then we're never going to master it. Does that make sense? Okay? Um. So I'm going to teach you one more, one more thing, and then we're going to get into you know, some of the other stuff that I think can deepen your understanding of the book of Isaiah 
to help you hear from God. Uh, and this is something you're going to hear from me uh, a lot. It was picked it up at this disciple making conference. It's the type of Bible study that these disciple making movements are doing. All right. So the first, so the the word soaps. All right. You can remember the word soaps, right? Five letters. Very simple. So S is for scripture. You get people reading the Bible. Now, it may be a chapter a day. That's fine. There's like sometimes we do this, we put out a challenge of the church. Okay, we're going to read through the Bible in a year. Well, that's to motivate people, but there's nothing that says you got to do it in a year. If you get people, you know, even just starting with Matthew and a chapter a day, you can get through. And there's some of the really small chapters you could double up on. You can get through the New Testament like that in about 10 months. Okay. And sometimes slower is better. So you get, you get into scripture. O stands for observe. Observe. What is scripture saying? All right. Now, we all know I could read, I could read uh, Ephesians once. And I'm going to see some things. I come back to it the next year, I'm going to see more. I come back to it again, I'm going to observe even more. So nobody is going to see everything there is to see in the first pass. And that's okay. One of the key, qu I mean, there's questions like who, what, where, when, why, how, who was the author, who was he writing to, what were the issues going on? You know, are there words that are repeated? There, there's stuff like that to observe. But even the a bigger question is what is God saying what is God saying to me today? Or what is the most important thing in this chapter that God is bringing to my attention? All right? If you can get somebody into scripture and simply asking that question. Now, if you, so my son is in Boy Scouts. If you teach a, a middle schooler how to start a fire and that's all you do and you leave, <laughs> there's a chance they're going to burn themselves. So, this is in the context of a relationship where we're working with them and helping to steer. Because sometimes somebody's, well, okay, what is, what is God saying to me today? Yeah, people might come up with some crazy things. But in the context of a community or a group, we can help, like, oh, you know, we serve as like the bumpers on a bowling alley. You ever see these? You know, you put the bumpers there, keep you from going in the gutter. Relationships serve as the bumpers. Other people who can say, mm, no, I, I, I think you're, I think you're, you're saying that's what you're hearing from God because that's what you want. That's what you wish God were saying to you, but that's not really what he's saying there. All right. So observe. A is apply. How can I obey today? I'm reading scripture. It's living and active. So the Holy Spirit is using scripture to address my life, to teach me, to guide me, to lead me into all truth. So, God, what is the most important thing for me to hear from you today? And then, how am I going to obey it today? Not, oh, yeah, that sounds like something I can work on next week. <laughs> how many of us do that with God? 
know, delayed obedience is what? Disobedience. Yeah. So we get reading scripture. God, what are you showing me today? How can I obey you today? Jesus says that the wise person is the one who hears his words and obeys them. Okay. We do this in the context of prayer. We're not alone in this. The Holy Spirit's helping us. You know, you can, you can read Scripture by yourself without the Holy Spirit. <coughs> there are plenty of academics who do. There's preachers who do. But if we're wanting to engage the living and active Word of God, then we do it in prayer. That has to be an active for you to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You must make a point to do that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, Kip was talking about staying connected. Uh, an illustration that, uh, that I really love is, is you're in the ocean and you're, you're in the water. If you just float the ocean will take you away from the boat. If you want to stay connected to the boat, you have to swim towards the boat or be grabbing onto a rope connected to the boat. Otherwise, drift is going to be the natural course of action or the, or the, the effect of inaction. So drift happens. In the ocean, in relationships. If we're not intentionally staying connected to God, to God's people, drift will result. Okay? There, there's, no, there's no just coasting. <laughs> and then the last one is share. Who can I share this with today? You know? We, we engage with people every day, don't we? Is there something that God's telling me that, hey, I was reading this today? You usually seek an opportunity. You just don't come up cold and dress. Yeah, but I mean, if, if coming up cold is. You would talk about talking to people, you're being connected. You look up and see what kind of. What church has he got on? Make an issue out of it. And start the conversation. Yeah. You can do that. You can also, like, hey, where, what are you reading? People, people talk about their interests so much. And yet the most important thing in our life we, we don't talk about. You know? Hey, I was, just, I was just reading this thing today. It was really encouraging to me. Can I share that with you? Who doesn't want to hear about something encouraging in this world? But the point is, and is this isn't like magical, like, oh, you, you start doing soaps and you got it. But this is a simple, I mean, any one of you could teach somebody how to do a Bible study with five, five letters. Okay. And uh, at the disciple making forum, I was talking, uh, I was doing one of the breakout sessions and David Roadcup, who was one of my uh, professors in seminary, he was talking about uh, uh, doing this with groups of guys. Okay, so because of his schedule, he teaches in Europe two months out of the year, so he has 10 months. He gets guys together in a high accountability relationship, and they meet together once a week in the mornings. And he has them read a chapter a day through the New Testament and ask and do these two questions. Okay. What's the most important thing God is saying to me? He has, he has them. He actually has it, you know, the whole journal, like for every day, like written out, just make it very simple. Like here's your, here's your binder with every day and space to write. Most important thing God showed me. How am I going to live this out? And then when they get together, 
their Bible study, you know, you get together once a week, you've had seven, seven days of seven chapters to choose from. And each person shares two days worth. Most important thing God showed you, and how are you going to obey it? And, then, and that's the conversation. That's the Bible study outline. Just this simple of a thing, getting men together and saying, what you hear from God? How'd you obey God? And he just facilitates. He doesn't teach. He could teach. He could do something like this. But the guys he's working with, career guys, family guys, high, I mean, some of these, like one was like a colonel in the army. Okay. High capacity guys, but they don't have time to leave that world and go off to seminary to be able to do what, what Dr. Roadcup could do. But they could do this. After 10 months, they go through the New Testament doing this, and then, he, then they're sent out two by two to go start similar groups. And that, that's another thing we sometimes forget about. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. And sometimes we make it sound like, oh, just you, by yourself. <laughs> you know. Uh, all right, so you're going to hear that from me cause a lot more because I'm convinced, you know, we, we, the harvest is plentiful. And the workers are sitting around thinking, we don't, we don't got the tools. But we do. All right. So with all that, now let's get into Isaiah. <laughs> uh, what I'm hoping to do here is, uh, this, is kind of, this is the overview, this is the introduction. 30,000 foot view of these 66 chapters. So that as we start going into chapter by chapter, section by section, we have, a, we have a better picture in mind of what's happening. All right, so what do we know about the author of Isaiah? As I mentioned earlier, he, he didn't call him a priest, but he had, he had access to the king. Yes. For whatever reason, he, whatever his prominent family, for whatever reason it is, yeah. He, he could get into him. Evidently, anytime he wanted to talk to the king, he had access. Yeah. And, and that wasn't the case for all the prophets. You know, some prophets, the kings were like, oh, yeah, I heard, you know, heard there's a guy out here in the, in the countryside. You know, he's a prophet. Go ask him. But no, Isaiah is there in the thick of things. Uh, Jewish tradition has that his father, Amos, was possibly a brother of King Amaziah. But then we also have his temple vision in Isaiah 6. So was Isaiah in the temple? Well, only priests go in the temple. So uh, was he possibly a priest? Um, you know, so there, there's some, there's stuff here we don't know Unlike Jeremiah, Jeremiah tells us a lot about his life. Um, Isaiah, we, we just know a little. We know he was married. Okay. Uh, Isaiah 7, 8, uh, he talks about his, uh, his wife, a prophetess. Uh, he had at least two sons, Shear Jashub, meaning a remnant shall return, which ends up being a, a very major theme throughout Isaiah, that there is discipline that's coming, but a remnant will return. And Maher Shalah Hashbaz. Okay. <coughs> uh, loosely translated, quickly to spoils, plunder speedily, because Assyria was going to come and plunder quickly uh, Israel's neighbor or Judah's neighbors. 
uh, he was a, his name means Yahweh is salvation. Also a major theme throughout the book. Uh, he served in the southern kingdom of Judah. Let me <clears throat> bring that here. All right, so at this point in time, Israel's history, or the people of Israel, there is the, it's called the divided kingdom. So you have King Saul, King David, King Solomon, and then after Solomon, there was a revolt, a revolt, a rebellion against Solomon's son, Rehoboam. Ten of the tribes became known as the northern tribes, Israel, where the southern tribe, Judah and Benjamin, became Judah. And of course, the Levites are, are scattered all, all over. So Israel and Judah, so they've been separated for quite a while at this point. And you also have Israel's northern neighbor, Syria, is going to come into play. <clears throat> and then we have kind of the, his, the, the big bad guys of this time, which is Assyria. Uh, now, Assyria, and uh, I'll get into, uh, well, no, we'll, we'll say it. We'll come, come back to that. Let's stick with uh, Isaiah for now. Um, at one point in his ministry, Isaiah goes naked for three years as a sign against uh, Egypt. He is believed to have been martyred by King Manasseh by being sawed in half. Okay, but this isn't in the Bible saying Isaiah was sawed into by Manasseh. This is tradition. Uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, the Hall of Faith, talks about some of the prophets, some of the men of God were sawed in two. So, possibly referring to Isaiah here. Also, Jesus even would note to the leaders, uh, religious leaders of the time, when he would say, "Who of the prophets did you did you know, did your four prophets not kill? You didn't want to, you, you killed them all." And you and he gives examples to so and so to so and so. If they didn't like what they had to say, I mean, of course, Jeremiah was the greatest example of that, of course. But he did. They didn't want to listen. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately for them. Um, Isaiah's ministry can be dated from at least 740 BC. Uh, that was the year that King Uzziah died. You see that Isaiah 6. Until 681 BC, the year that Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, died. Okay, so mass scholars, how long is that? All right, 59 years of ministry. That's, that's quite a while, you know, outliving quite a few, quite a few kings. Now, on your notes there, I have mentioned Deutero-Isaiah and 3rd Isaiah. So, I bring this up for this reason. You know, we, we, this is a Student Sunday. We have our graduates. They're going off to college. Sometimes churches, you know, we're like, oh, well, let's just not mention this type of stuff. Then the, then the person goes off to college or picks up a, a book, a commentary, and suddenly, oh, there's possibly three authors of Isaiah. Our church never talked about this. Well, what else are they hiding? So we're going to talk about it. So some argue that the book of Isaiah was actually written by two or three authors and then edited together. Chapters 1 through 39 are generally agreed to be written by Isaiah, son of Amos. Very symbolic, too. Old Testament has 39 books. Oh, right. And then 60, 27 to 66, we read the, you know, 66 yeah. in the Bible, 66 books in Isaiah. <laughs> so, chapters, the rest of the chapters are possibly another author or two different authors. Um, possibly. Oh, I'll get into what I think here in a little bit. But chapters 40 to 55 are believed to deal with events of the Babylonian exile 
post 587 BC. And when did I say Isaiah died? About six, eight months, about a hundred years. Yeah. So the question. For some, it's the idea that, well, there's no supernatural. God doesn't actually foretell events to this prophet, so he couldn't have. That, that's an that's a issue some people raise. Others, however, believe that God does do prophecy, but the question is, would Isaiah be writing about events that aren't going to be relevant to his contemporaries for over a hundred years in the future. It's one thing to say like this thing's going to happen in the future, but to write like, here's how you deal with it. <laughs> some people wonder like, so that'd be like if somebody in 1900 wrote about how the church should respond to COVID-19. Well, for 125 years, COVID-19, that wasn't a thing for us to worry about. So would that writing have been kept, let alone preserved and passed on and uh, made into a prominent place um, so that when we needed it, it would be relevant? That's a, I think it's a valid question to ask. Now we can disagree about uh, about what it, you know the an answer to that, but this is the way some people process through. So if you pick up a book on Isaiah uh, <clears throat> and they start talking about Deutero Isaiah or just a way of saying second Isaiah or third Isaiah, you're you're not you're not surprised. Okay? Uh, chapters 56 through 66 are believed to deal with events after the return from exile. And they, they also, people, uh, scholars, see like a different style of writing. Okay? So it's not only you have these different events being talked about, but different style, um, which kind of makes you think, well, it it's kinda, it sounds like it's written by a different person. So key questions here that people ask, style changes, um, uh, writing about events that, you know, it's the same kind of thing. People, some people think that the Sermon on the Mount is not for us, that those are, those are Jesus' instructions for the, for the millennial kingdom. Are you really telling me that for two thousand years, Sermon on the Mount is meaningless? I, nah, I don't. I don't buy that. Um, but this third question here, towards the bottom of the page, is something that we need to wrestle with. Because if you're reading a commentary, or let's say there's a pastor who preaches a sermon, and they agree that there's a uh, two or three authors to Isaiah. Would we consider Isaiah 40 to 66 to be less authoritative as scripture if it was written by someone other than Isaiah, son of Amos? If it was written by a, a, a disciple in the school of Isaiah, disciple and, you know, maybe a disciple of Isaiah's disciples. And they wrote, would it be, I mean, we don't know the author of Hebrews, do we? Well, God's message is to us the same no matter who the instructor is. All scripture is God breathed, therefore, it doesn't matter what person put it on ink or put it on the paper. If it all, if you either believe it all comes from God or you don't. And so many, that's what can be a problem. Yeah. So many people like to choose which one. They do, and no, I have, one time I invited somebody to that to, to class we had a Daniel. Uh, me and that person was probably, me and Daniel don't agree very much. Like <laughs> What's that got to do with whether or not right. it's accurate or not? Okay. So, in, in the same way, you know, like I believe that uh, the Pentateuch, Genesis uh, through Deuteronomy, were written by Moses. 
And yet at the very end, it has an account of Moses' death. So, did Moses write it and then go up to the mountain to die? Or did maybe Joshua finish off the book by right? Because it also talks about how Moses was the most humble man who ever lived. Well, Moses writing that about himself would kind of contradict that. So, if there, there was a second or third Isaiah, and it all gets put together under this book, under the heading of Isaiah, that would not destroy my faith. Okay? Well, I mention it because other people mention it. And if... Are if, you looking at it from an earthly point of view and you're trying to disprove it? That's your point if you're looking for one, two, and three. Well... I don't necessarily think so. I think that there are some faithful Christians who are just honestly asking questions and trying to make sense of what they see. And, and they're, they're, so you have one group who comes from the perspective of uh, there's, there's no prophecy. Okay? They come with the assumption that God doesn't reveal the future. Therefore, a prophecy in Isaiah about Cyrus, king of Persia, could not have happened until, you know, they could only write about past events. So after Cyrus, then they could write about Cyrus. If, if that is, and I agree, if that would be a worldly perspective if, if that's their motivation. However, if you say there's no prophecy, but you use the Old Testament, Oh, the, they would. A lot of them would say that it was written after the fact. It's like retroactive. Like something happens, then years later they write about it, and and yeah. So, so there are bad actors like that who write about scripture. But I think there's also faithful believers who wrestle with these questions who see. Okay, this looks like the like it was written by, you know, like some people think that Hebrews was written by the Apostle Paul. But you look at the style of writing in, in the book of Hebrews and the rest of Paul's letters, it, it's different. Hebrews is more of a sermon than a letter, at least in the example of Paul. We can kind of see these are different authors. So faithful people could be asking these questions and come to the conclusion that maybe there were these multiple authors, but it doesn't mean that they're, they're coming at it trying to disprove it. They're just trying to understand it. So just because somebody mentions Duro Isaiah, it doesn't mean, oh, you're automatically a liberal who just doesn't want, doesn't want to believe scripture. They may be, but they may, may, but they may not be. Okay. However, I think there's a very good reason to trust that Isaiah was the whole book, all six six chapters were written by Isaiah, son of Amos. Can somebody open up and read for us John twelve thirty seven through forty one? John 12, and it's going to be 37 through 41. <laughs> but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him. That the word of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled when he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe because Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should see with their eyes and understand with the heart. These things should turn so that I should kill them. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. Okay. So here's Jesus referring to Isaiah, two different passages in Isaiah. The second one is from Isaiah 6. All right. The 
blind, the, blind their eyes and, and stop their ears. The first one is from Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the greatest, to me, the greatest chapter in the book that describes the work of the Christ, who he mm -hmm. was and what he did. Nothing, I mean, that completely tells you everything you want to yeah. know. And Jesus says, Isaiah saw my glory. The glory in Isaiah 6, where he sees God. The glory in Isaiah 53, where he sees the cross. Okay? And Jesus says, it's the same Isaiah. So, if I'm going to trust anybody, I'm going to trust Jesus. So, then how do I explain different styles of writing? Well, over 59 years, I imagine your writing style can change a bit. When you're writing about different situations, different scenarios, you know, one person could write a uh, uh, op-ed to the news to the newspaper, and then turn around and write a work of fiction uh, for a novel. It doesn't mean he's a different person; it's just different styles of writing from one hand. Also, when we look through, it, I didn't get into all the details on this. That through Isaiah, there are some common features common language that he uses through all 66. Uh, for example, I, he calls God the Lord of hosts more so than other writers of Scripture, and that's all throughout. Now, as far as writing about things that are uh, future, it's possible that he had instructions like, hey, you know, if he if he did have disciples, say, hey, I want you to keep this around <laughs> for me. You know, there's there's things that are going to happen. Hold on to this. This is for this is for the future. Is it also possible that Isaiah did what so many of them, especially over a long period of time, when they wrote stuff, they had secretaries, they had people writing it down for them, and if, at sixty years, he might have had. If that was true, he might have. Four or five different assistants, writers, helper, and their styles. Oh, yeah. Would, yeah. You know, you can come up with all kinds of reasons not to believe. But as you said, what's the one? We have one in entity, one unit, in individual confirming it was him. The ultimate yeah. God himself confirmed that he did it all. So, yeah. So if, if I come across somebody who's still wrestling with that question, I don't automatically assume that they're, they're not a brother or sister in the faith. I got to read a little bit more to see what they say, to see why they say that. And so I can give people grace. But we also use discernment so that those who are saying like, oh, well, prophecy can't happen. Let me explain this away by worldly or natural things, because there are scholars who do that, well, then I can use my discernment to say, okay, I don't need to listen to that, to that part, at least, especially not devotionally. You know, uh, I may read to learn what he says so I can answer his, his questions, but I don't... Uh, but reading somebody like that versus reading and say, okay, let me actually learn from this person is very different. Okay, Bill? How much does the act of translation from one language to another, another have on style? Um, it, it does factor in the, if anything, it's more likely to flatten a style because if you have one translator or one group of translators translating, uh, you know, all of Isaiah or translating Isaiah and Jeremiah, there's a possibility that in their translation, they make Isaiah and Jeremiah sound similar in style because you have the one translator or the one group translating. But we, we do know enough about Hebrew to scholars to go and translators to go in 
and deal directly with the Hebrew and see the differences in style in the original Hebrew. Now, I am not nearly as versed in Hebrew to do that. That's, you know, I know people who are, who can do like that and, and with the Greek, but, uh, but that's, that's not my gift. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there, there's, there's things with it, like words they use, phrases, like you have uh, chapters 1 through 39 use a certain image, but doesn't get used in chapters 40 through 66, and they use a different image, like suffering servant starts to show up in, in 40 through 66, not in 1 through 39. There they, they talk about the branch. Um, so there's stuff like that that causes people to, to ask questions. All right, for the sake of time, we're going we're gonna to move on here. Um, so second page of the notes, we have, uh, and, and some of this I'm going to let you read for yourself, some of the major crises uh, your TC was starting to get, get into uh, with Assyria. Um, the big thing I want you to know about that is so the Assyrian Empire in the 700s is starting to come west. Okay? So they are starting to make some moves and add pressure, um, which is a major factor of, uh, during the ministry of, of Isaiah calling the kings of Israel to trust God instead of politics or military. So the, the first crisis, um, so Israel and Syria want Judah to join a political alliance, okay? Uh, and anti-Assyria, so it's like NATO. I mean, they want you to ally with us against Assyria. Well, Judah says, no, I'm not going to join your alliance. And, and so Israel and Syria said, fine, we'll attack you. Dethrone your king, put up a, somebody who will agree, and then we'll be able to have a united front against Assyria. So I think it's Ahaz. Isaiah tells Ahaz, hey, God's got this. Trust in God to deal with Syria and Israel. But he doesn't. Instead, he forms an alliance with Assyria. He invites the, the wolf into the hen house to deal with the coyotes. <laughs> and ends up making them a, a vassal state. And Assyria, you have to understand, Assyria, this is the ancient world's Nazis. Okay? Brutal. Um, like flaying people alive kind of brutality. Absolutely, absolutely horrendous. Um, and so he's going to make an alliance with them to protect against these other two. Uh, later on, Hezekiah, you know, says, all right, we're not with Assyria anymore and tries to join with Egypt. Which, is Assyria just going to let that happen? No, they're going to bring all of their might down. And you know, on their way to deal with Egypt, they're going to go right through. So you have kind of this with both Egypt and Assyria, these armies that are just going to come through. This, that they're just right on the highway. And along the way, soldiers got to get fed. Loot's got to be plundered. Might as well hit them while, while you're there. Uh, so Hezekiah, you know, is trying to trying to maneuver these things, but it doesn't work. Now they're under threat from Assyria, and Isaiah says, "No, trust in God." And so God sends Assyria away. Don't you think the and I've always tried to explain from a from a, a political point of view, if you are Assyrian, you say we are the masters of the world. You really need Egypt. You need to go conquer, take Egypt. That that would be your goal, and it just so happens that that little slip of land, because everything to the west, to the east is desert. So 
So you need to go, I mean, they didn't have the navies we have today. So how do you get to, to pry Egypt? You have to go down that little slip of land and you just take care of oh, yeah. that's there. So with Egypt as the goal, and that's why in northern Israel they got what we call the Megiddo plain. And I mean, historically, thousands of battles <coughs> have been happened there because that's that takes you down. Yeah, because otherwise you got to go through the desert. Right. You're not, you're not going to do that. And the thing about empires, you know, and you see this with the Roman Empire, empires have to expand because, you know, they, they're, for for one thing, you have these giant militaries of your empire. If all those soldiers aren't doing something, well, yeah, what, what, what are they going to do? They're going to, you know, they're going to fight somebody and they want to get paid. Well, if, if we, if we want to keep our economy growing, you know, we, we got we to gotta get more plunder. So, like, we, we saw this with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, they, they had to keep expanding for economic reasons. Until they got to this area of the world and they couldn't defeat the, uh, the Scythians. And it was kind of like once they ran out of land to conquer, they, they started to stagnate. And things started to... It took a while. Then they divided. <laughs> yeah. So Assyria has to keep expanding. Um, if, if for no other reason, each Assyrian king has to has to show himself superior because otherwise he's going to get assassinated. And we saw that we see that with uh, Sennacherib, his sons kill him. So so that they can't they can't just say okay we got enough land. They have empires have to expand, and so you so you got Israel between two empires, Egypt. And Assyria, and they're they're going to butt heads now. Waiting on deck is Babylon. Babylon is this emerging empire that once Assyria gets too big, too much land to cover, too many foreign peoples that have no you know, you either make them. Uh, they they assimilate and and become like not just uh, uh, conquered peoples, but they become uh, Assyrian people, or you keep them pushed down by fear. Well, that only works for so long. So Babylon gets together with the Medes, and they form an alliance, and they take Assyria, and then inherit all of Assyria's empire. Well, and that means now Israel has to deal with Babylon. Eventually, Babylon's going to conquer them. So Assyria is going to take out the northern kingdom of Israel. Babylon is going to take out the southern kingdom of Judah, send them in exile. And this is punishment from God. But then Babylon is going to, you know, 70 years. And then the Medes and the Persians are going to take out Babylon. And they're going to have a different policy. They say, all right, you can all go back home. So this is this really volatile area. And the, the main question Isaiah and Israel or Isaiah and Judah have to deal with is, do we trust God or do we trust something else? Whether that's politics, military, idols, and Israel's or Judah, excuse me, they're trusting everybody but God. But God's going to preserve a remnant. There's going to bring be punishment, but there's going to be a remnant left. Uh, and so there, so one through thirty nine, we see this uh, um, a lot of judgment. But 40 through 66, a lot of hope of restoration. Now, because of time, I'm going to have to just leave you to do some study on your own. 
uh, the ESV study Bible includes a list of, of major themes. All right. I encourage you to look that over because uh, as you start to read it chapter by chapter, you're going to see some of these themes pop up and help make sense. Um, there's a helpful outline of the book of Isaiah. Uh, you know, we got the introduction, chapters one through five. Uh, now, next week, uh, Dean Gamble is going to teach, because I'll be preaching, but kind of uh, do a snapshot, one through five. <clears throat> you have Isaiah's call in chapter six, and then these major crises in Isaiah's words of prophecy about them, chapter seven through 39. And then 40 through 55 you go, kind of go from an Israel-specific more towards a, <clears throat> um, to a grander future. You know, that God is going to deal with Israel and preserve this remnant, not just for Israel's sake, but for this greater calling. And, and that I will dive back into because we don't have time to go into today. Um, to put Isaiah in the context of God's covenants um, and then the, the future glory transformation. The other thing I have is kind of a timeline. Um, so it's like two pages. The first page is from 830 BC to 670. And you can kind of see like where things are happening and what books of the Bible are associated with these different events. Um, and there at the kind of the bottom of the page, you see where Isaiah's ministry sits. Um, and Micah and Obed, um, as long with the, the different kings. And then on the second page, you have from 670 to 510. So you kind of see the, the Babylon um, and where things fall in terms of like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, Daniel. Um, Second Chronicles, Second Kings. So, just a helpful tool that uh, I wanted to make available to you. So, so that's kind of the the intro, and and I do encourage you to read through Isaiah uh, one through five this week in preparation, and uh, you know, start uh, thinking through. And remember, this is the living and active Word of God. Yes, it was written to people uh, 2,700 years ago, but the Holy Spirit who wrote it is still with us today to speak to us. All right? Well, let me pray for us and let you go. Father God, thank you for today, for the opportunity to uh, gather here, to uh, listen to your word, to uh, uh, learn from you. I pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom and insight as we engage in Scripture to uh, hear from you uh, what you want us to hear, and not just to hear, but to obey, to apply, and to share it with others. Lord, we pray for those who are not here today, who are out traveling or celebrating Mother's Day in, in various ways. We pray you will watch over them until we can come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.